30 years ago, a beautiful Canadian Baywatch girl fell in love with the drummer from Motley Crue, and then a disgruntled carpenter stole their sex tape, and the rest is history. You can see it all in the new limited series, Pam and Tommy. I think it's fair to see some kind of similarities between the criticisms that I'm making and those kinds of YouTube channels you would see that are like going after media for woke pandering and virtue signaling. And I think there are a lot of similarities there. There is a lot of crossover. Hulu is the villain of this story, as presented by Hulu. I've been thinking a lot recently about the show Pam and Tommy. There's this scene in Pam and Tommy that keeps kind of repeating in my mind. It's a scene where Pamela's having to deal with lawyers, and specifically it involves her being forced to rewatch the leaked sex tape between her and Tommy Lee. You know, she could tell you who's on the tape. You don't have to watch the whole damn thing. As part of these legal proceedings. A case that pertains to whether she has the right to claim that these are her own private materials, or whether it's become enough of a public, newsworthy item that she no longer has that right, that it becomes a kind of freedom of speech issue somehow. Uh, and the show really focuses in on Pamela's perspective through this, you know, emphasizing what a traumatic and invasive experience this is for her versus the lawyers who are presented pretty unsympathetically for the most part, really just trying to justify their own gross voyeurism and lack of respect for someone who's been deemed essentially public property by nature of their profession. Apparently they spend most of the video completely naked. Yeah. Or as Pam likes to call it, work attire. <laughs> and the whole time, I'm just thinking... Last night, a source tells People Magazine that the show is re-exploiting Pamela and revisiting a, quote, very traumatic time in her Pamela life. Pamela Anderson is not feeling the upcoming Hulu series Pam and Tommy or the actors playing them. She has voiced that she does not want this series out there, that she doesn't care to discuss this any further, and that it was a traumatizing event, understandably. I don't even understand why Hulu would do this against the will of the person whose privacy was breached. They're listening to a recreation of that same private sex tape. The things being said, the things being shown, are all things gathered from that private tape. The only justification for them is also one of legal technicality. And by extension, the showrunners, the cast involved in the production, are also working under the same legal justifications as the villains presented by the show. I have the right to stream it for free. I want to stream it for profit. This is a scene that comes in fairly late in the show's run, but that feeling of contradiction and hypocrisy is Pam and Tommy. <sighs> the thing to understand about Pam and Tommy is that Tommy Lee is that Tommy Lee was gonna be played by James Franco. I think an important piece of context to understand about Pam and Tommy is that it started development as a Seth Rogen, Evan Goldberg project with obviously Seth in one of the lead roles and James Franco also in a lead role. And I think from that alone, you can extrapolate a lot about what this project probably was earlier in its development. <laughs> Like, I forget the name of the Tommy Wiseau movie they did, but like, that is the level of production I think they were shooting for originally. You know, uh, the bumbling kind of dummy in over their head criminality uh, plot was uh, entertaining, I thought. Uh, and so maybe I thought that's where, I, you know, I, I, I first jockeyed heavily to play Tommy. I don't say this to imply that Seth Rogen and obviously James Franco aren't capable of doing like serious work. Well, the specific case of Pam and Tommy, you can really sense that dual tension. A simultaneous desire to tell a fairly serious feminist kind of narrative, but also it's a Seth Rogen show. Well, we've been down this road before and it never ends well. So imagine a microwave, but for cold. <laughs> King Crimson, yeah? Oh, that's the first pressing! Taking this outrageous, scandalous, true story type 
thing. Uh, leaning into both the comedic absurd aspects, um, but also uh, getting more into the drama behind these sorts of things. It's a work of entertainment, and like any work of entertainment, it's gonna always have that kind of contradiction to it. A desire to tell a serious story with a serious narrative behind it. Yeah. Also understanding this need to create media that entertains people, that engages people, that's scandalous in a very kind of surface, enjoyable way. I'm not saying this to be like, elitist about what the people involved in the show's production are capable of. But when you imagine a Seth Rogen, James Franco creative project, um, you sort of get an image of, in your head of what that's going to be. And what I'm not imagining is a story that has a very self-serious feminist message behind it. A show that is quite powerful in that. You provide a reason as to why you and Mr. Lee would make a pornographic tape, if it wasn't like all of your other pornographic activities for the purpose of financial gain. And really shows a lot of empathy on the lines of misogyny, but also to some extent class. A show that does explore the various intersections of celebrity with culture, the ways that societal misogynies develop and are wielded. You almost get this sense through it that as the show was being made, they realized there was a kind of inherent cruelty to bringing this all back up, when obviously it's premised on a leaked private sex tape. The base idea of the show is to go back to the sex tape. So, like half my audience, like 20 at this point. so early in the internet, it was just like a bunch of guys on IRC channels who would be sharing links to um, websites. You used to have these things called websites, now it's apps, it's like free apps, probably two pretty soon. And Pamela Anderson, one of the biggest female celebrities at the time, and especially for a certain type of audience, thanks to Baywatch and reruns. One of the cooler things the show actually does get into is how Pamela wanted the show to be a little bit more than it ended up being. Point being, she had a private tape between her and Tommy Lee. The tape ended up being stolen by a disgruntled worker of Tommy Lee's, and it became one of the first major viral tapes. Now obviously this is eons ago at this point and the world has changed and misogyny's over. And now I guess the point is, is when you make a piece of media about an event like this, you can end up coming away with quite a definitive feminist message behind it, which is what the show really is. Judge almost made the decision that her body kind of belonged to the collective. Yes. And not to herself. It's hard for me to wrap my head around it. One of the difficulties with criticizing this show is that I genuinely feel like a lot Lot of the people involved in the production genuinely wanted to make something positive. And I think it's very difficult to come away from the show itself without seeing those positive messages that they wanted to spread. How Pamela Anderson was used, how her agency was robbed from her, these assumptions that led to these corporate entities taking advantage, how the system inherently privileged these institutions. I get the validity of the free speech argument but for a judge just to accept it out of hand with no counter-argument that I don't get it. Well, they have to say something. They can't say the actual reason. They can't actually say that sluts don't get to decide what happens to pictures of their body. It, it is pretty incisive at times. And again, I, I don't think that you can question that this is the message. And my mum liked it, so it really can't be that bad. Oh my god, I feel I'm absolutely love Pamela and I can't believe what she went through. I remember that coming out. What a strong person to have anything like that and I've literally it's changed everything I thought about that whole situation. And if you say otherwise, um, I won't remove your comment but I'll see it and I will cry. But like, that sense of invasion of privacy is something that's very relatable and understandable. Okay, so Lily James had a statement that ended up in a bunch of articles where she was essentially saying, you know, we're all complicit in what happened. That's kind of part of the message is that everyone wanted this tape and it was this thing that, you know, everyone's kind of voyeuristic in there. Like everyone wanted to kind of peek, peek over the hedges a little bit and see into the lives of these celebrities. And, you know, you know we're all complicit. Um, and it's like, but Lily, you put on a prosthetic mold of Pamela Anderson's boobs and then read out a script that was made up of things that she said in privacy 
Um, and you only even know what they are because they were leaked in a sex tape. And you're now making a show about how it being leaked and then being exploited by media was wrong. And you're recreating the sex tape. It became about even bigger than Pamela, like about what the universal thing of like how that would feel. And I just wanted to really try and convey that. And... Um... Hopefully, you know, change people's perspective on it. You're getting, like, awards nominations for this. Making a show that the people involved could be sitting in, like, a movie theater and then suddenly that pops up. It's so private. They could be invited to the awards show that you're going to be probably nominated for. Like, we're all complicit, but... Come on. I loved when you talked about, like, the desensitization, like, how desensitized we, we're becoming as, like, a society and how that's getting worse and worse. That, okay, the thing is, the thing about the show is that I think you can't really get away from the fact that he's totally hypocritical. We can say we don't want to traumatise Pamela Anderson again, when, but... When I showed the bit where she was um, with solicitors and that, with lawyers, <sighs> fucking hell, like, um, that was... That, to re-watch that, the abuse what went on there, to re-watch that will be tra traumatic for her. I, I can't believe that was even allowed, but I hope through showing them fucking shocking things, that's why I've got so much respect for her. So, I, I hope she didn't fucking watch it. <laughs> she said she never it, will, yeah, she said that she'll never her. watch it. I love you, Pamela. I hope that she's just going, I love you, Pamela, I love you, <laughs> that. But I thought, in general, if that was her character and that was written quite well, she come off, like, really lovely. I thought, what a lovely yeah. person. Basically, to talk about Pam and Tommy, I need to do the impossible, which is create a space online in which I can say, I'm critical of this thing, but I don't think that... All of the people involved were evil. I don't think people were just thinking, oh, this matches up with an algorithm and this is what people want right now and it'll be a hit and it'll make money and you'll get awards for it and prestige and everyone will respect you for creating this show with this powerful message. Oh man, I feel terrible for women. But on the other hand, it, it kind of just is what it is. And, and there's obviously no argument from ignorance because that's what the show is about. Episode to episode is a show about the nature of consent, and especially the nature of consent as it pertains to celebrities. Celebrity. Resentment. Resenting celebrities. Resenting people that are high in status in society. Um, there's a ContraPoints video about it. I don't remember what she says in it. But I think the basic gist is that we recognize that certain people seem to be positioned above us in society and we're constantly questioning why that is. And this is also something that Pam and Tommy gets into. Why does bad stuff keep happening to me when good stuff is supposed to be happening to me? Karma is supposed to be on my side, but it is not. On the character of Rand, uh, I say character because it's just not the guy. Rand is this quasi-religious, Repentant guy that feels hard done by and then in the end feels pretty guilty about the things that he did I'm so sorry. Uh, I, And I guess that's supposed to be kind of communicating the overall message of the show um, Rand Gautier was not like that. He didn't actually feel that way. Do you think it's overly nice to the bloke who stole the tapes? It, it makes him look a bit stupid, doesn't it? I wouldn't say... I mean his life went to shit, didn't it? Like he's lucky to be alive Really, you know. If only it just took the contents of the safe, but and and didn't sell the sell the tape. What he done to her was life changing. So I hope that he did suffer. At this point, I'm not really the type of person who's like criticizing media by saying where the factual inaccuracies are because it's like true crime biopic type series or movies or whatever. I guess it's like whatever. The, the, you should really just assume that you're not getting a true story. It's like the whole true story thing. It's just marketing. If you really want to know more about the details of something, I'm afraid you're still going to have to probably read a book about it. I know it sucks. I don't like to read books. I've been trying to read this fucking book for like several months now. Uh, I, I have a master's degree in English literature. I've got no more time for books. I've got no, no more time for it. I've got things to do, like City Skylines Let's Plays. I've got, I got Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving to go to. <laughs>
What was I talking about? Rand in the show talks a lot about karmic debt. Talking about karma. Happiness comes due to good actions, suffering results from evil actions. The Mahabharata. Well, karma was handling that. I am karma. And I'm a bitch. And the idea of retribution, of just desserts. And, and I think this concept of debts as it pertains to celebrities is definitely something that's pretty important to the show's overall statement. In society, there is this impulse to kind of judge people and consider if they deserve what they have and you deserve what you have, and there's nothing inherently wrong with that. And in the case of Rand, as they highlight in the first couple episodes, you can understand the sense of injustice, that he's someone who was doing work for them and then was completely fucked over by Tommy Lee. Tommy Lee gets fucked over and it's like, no. in purely material terms, it's like whatever. Whereas for someone like Rand, he could be really materially fucked by something like that. <laughs> The show isn't unwilling to be empathetic to that, if not for Rand specifically, then at least for people that would be in similar positions to Rand. But there's a monetary incentive, but we also accept a kind of internal justification based on the idea that these celebrities have accrued a social debt because of how many privileges they have, earned by... What, making some cool music? Being on the front cover of Playboy? And that pretty naturally leads into this kind of misguided class consciousness being co-opted by reactionary beliefs. And without examining this latent misogyny in society, ends up just targeting someone that realistically already had their struggles within society that Rand wasn't aware of as per the narrative of the show. A again, I want to make it clear that usually when I'm talking about the show, I am talking about the people as characters because there are so many inaccuracies to the specifics of the people themselves. I don't get to decide what happens to my actual body so they say something else instead. Hypocrisy is a big subject. Probably more so than any other a bad thing you could do. The idea of doing something in a hypocritical way um, is a really, really big deal on the internet. If you've got the internet and there's like one guy who's proudly killed a hundred puppies and then like a second guy who's like, I think killing puppies is great, but he actually hasn't killed any puppies. The, the second guy is a fucking, he's a piece of work. Uh, for me, it's always the hypocrisy. I, I don't care how many people you kill. When it comes to Hulu and Pam and Tommy, God, I feel that. Obviously, Pamela Anderson did not consent to the show being made. They reached out to her multiple times and she continued not to consent to the show's production nor being involved in it which probably sent some kind of statement and Tommy Lee obviously wasn't involved at all and I don't know if he even was gotten in touch with but you know I guess he's irrelevant to his leaked sex tape whole fucking world looking at my dick and, and the fact that the only justification to turn that scandal into this big prestigious TV thing the only justification is a legal one it's the fact that this is a public news item that this is enough of of a public story that you can technically legally justify making Lily James, Pamela Anderson, tit prosthetics, uh, and then having her recreate the private sex tape. You, you can justify that on a legal basis. I think Pam and Tommy winds up being an excellent case study for this particular kind of algorithmic contradiction which I've come to refer to as Netflix exploitation. You might be thinking, Jack, uh, Pam and Tommy wasn't made by Netflix, it was made by Hulu. And I'm here to say that doesn't matter for two reasons. One, the basic underlying philosophy and system is shared by a lot of these companies. Uh, and secondly, because Netflix exploitation sounds the best. It just sounds better. Sometimes you've just got to accept the sheer utility of a cool sounding word even if it doesn't fit in the majority of cases. Think of it as an icebreaker. The fact that this isn't really a Netflix thing and just kind of how streaming series are made now. You follow an algorithm that says the thing you should be making usually based on controversy, but you're also keeping track of what the progressive line is on the thing. So you can kind of season the controversial algorithmically generated content with that uh, and make something that simultaneously exploitative 
Um, and woke. That's why I do think we continue to be seeing series and documentaries and movies about crimes and events that are sympathetic to victims, not involving those victims in the actual process. Because it can get in the way of the messaging. Again, it's tough because I don't think that individual people involved in the show meant it that way. But they were also very aware of what they were doing. And I know that because that's what the show is. That's what the show is is about. The story is unbelievable. And it was an opportunity to really delve into our society and this devouring of celebrity culture. I think it's fair to see some kind of similarities between the criticisms that I'm making and those kinds of YouTube channels you would see that are like going after media for woke pandering and virtue signaling and that sort of thing. It's probably one of those areas where people that are genuinely concerned about the co-opting of these issues can maybe have a little bit of unity. Yeah, I think there's probably people that are genuinely concerned with issues of contradiction and hypocrisy, uh, especially when it comes to these large institutions kind of wielding progressive messaging as a way to avoid certain other criticisms that are readily apparent. I guess the main difference is that usually with those videos, they're using woke pandering virtue signaling type criticisms more just as a cipher for genuinely disagreeing with the ideology that's being expressed. Because like I say, I for the most part really do agree with a lot of the kinds of views that are expressed in Pam and Tommy. I think it's definitely the kind of media that in another context I would just freely recommend to people as a way to maybe educate them or open their eyes to a certain perspective they might not have considered in a fun, entertaining way. For me, before, I just thought, oh yeah, Pamela Anson, yeah, Baywatch, yeah. The woman went through an unbelievable man, and to got through the other side of that, that must have been horrific. The whole thing is that the fact that I agree with the view doesn't mean all of a sudden I think, oh, it's okay, and, and we, we shouldn't be making these kinds of criticisms. I think there's criticisms to be made, even in cases where I actually agree with the views being expressed, and don't even necessarily disagree that much with how they're presented. I'm not secretly saying I disagree with the views expressed in the show, I have criticisms external to the views expressed by the show. I'm not, like, a coward who just kind of hides what he really thinks about things underneath like a Oh, it's really about uh, hypocrisy and just playing fairly by the rules. Hypocrisy was the problem. That's what it was. It wasn't feminism. I think feminism's good. Type thing. Empathy tourism is a term that I've been seeing more and more over the past few months. And I do think that's definitely an accurate one when it comes to a show like Pam and Tommy. It's stopping along the trail of scandalous media with big names that you can pull in an easy crowd for. Drizzled with societally appropriate sympathies. And you know it's tough because also to some extent empathy tourism is what media is, is what any piece of media about someone's story or adapted from someone's story or loosely based on someone's story. A lot of art is a kind of empathy tourism but that doesn't mean that it can't be obviously exploitative. <laughs> that doesn't mean it can't be obviously hypocritical. Um, and, I, and I think the inherent shallowness that comes as a result of those hypocrisies definitely runs through a lot of the production. I noticed the incredibly toothless depictions of Hugh Hefner and to a lesser extent Tommy Lee. Um, Hugh Hefner, I mean, before the show even came out, he was being outed for... And, and you know, uh, it's disputed. I, I'm sh I know Playboy Group, I'm sure that they, oh no, they're actually fully behind uh, the the outing of Hugh Hefner. Wow, that's th that's really, that's really bad. And then Tommy Lee. Now, obviously I did actually do a previous video about the depiction of Tommy Lee in media. I didn't mean to become a Motley Crue based YouTube channel. And I say this as someone who's a fan of at least two of their songs. My feelings about Pamela are very different to that, what I think about him. He was on his way down, but wasn't as known, and she was known. There, there are Motley Crue fans that will disagree with you. Unfortunately, I'm not a Motley Crue Fan, but <laughs> Tommy's definitely a lot more openly critical of Tommy Lee as a persona. But 
you know, he also beat up Pamela Anderson. And that's something that's left to, like, a caption at the very tail end of the show. And, and I'm not saying this in, like, a, oh, they needed to depict the abuse, because I do think there is this wider problem of even creating a show like this in the first place. The, the fundamental ethical question is, does your consent matter in these types of cases? And I think the show emphatically is saying, yes, it does matter. So how can it be what it is? The numbers are still strong, but the growth curve... We need a pop. The answer is because the underlying motivations of the show were monetary, and the underlying reason for its production was algorithmic. A system designed to mass-produce agreeable media. And sadly, that does end up involving a lot of the people that are involved in these productions. A lot of the people that end up promoting these types of productions. People that are also being sold the progressive messaging, and not the disgusting machine that's underneath all of this. The streaming machine will continue to consume every topic that bears interest with the public. It is a non-ethical machine with ethics spray-painted on top of it. And I think Pam and Tommy is just one of many shows and movies and documentaries that works as a product of these things. My aim is to create a space where I can say, I think this piece of media is wrong and bad, but I don't think that the people involved in making it were evil people who wanted to make something traumatizing, and I don't think they wanted to think of it as making a show against the consent of the people being victimized in those events. But that also is just what it is. I like Craig Gillespie a lot. I really like Lars and the Real Girl. I really like I, Tonya. I think Seth Rogen will be a great Donkey Kong. Sebastian Stan, I mean, it's him and Jonathan Groff, and that's gonna be my list, and those are those are my two. It's what we will call the Netflix exploitation pincer maneuver of algorithmically generated controversy and progressive messaging, and you just whew. Pam and Tommy, I liked it. I think it has a positive message, and it's probably an indictment of the culture that we currently live in. And I think it's important that we as a society are able to simultaneously condemn and enjoy things, because I think hypocrisy isn't just a bad thing that we should always watch out for, it's kind of the lifeblood of civilization. Am I being a hypocrite? by making a video talking about the show? Am I just feeding into this by knowingly making a I'm so triggered and offended video about a piece of scandalous media? Like, it's scandalous media, it's made to be that. So I'm kind of just like a performer playing my role in this bit. Maybe I shouldn't be publicly critiquing media. Maybe I shouldn't be critiquing media. Maybe I shouldn't be watching media. Maybe I should go live in the mountains. To that, I've always resigned myself to the fact that these videos are for an audience, they're for people to maybe reconsider their perspectives on things. I'm not expecting videos like mine to change how the production of these big shows are actually done. Because I think for the most part, these shows are made by smart people who often know better, and especially in the case of this show, I know that. Uh, because that is the message of the show. Hulu exploitation, Disney exploitation, HBO Max exploitation. I just hope it didn't traumatize Pam again. I'm sure that it will actually have a positive influence for, of what people think of her. No, I, I've got a lot of respect for her. I, I really am, and I hope that does that for, uh... Uh, it's the age-old question of if you can have uh, talking dick, Seth Rogen stoner comedy, and uh, powerful feminist messaging. Um, and I still think it's possible, and I think that the, that media is out there, and it's actually our job to find it. Seth Rogen loves weed, dude. You know a guy who loves weed? <laughs> Listen, bro. The time right now is 8.47, okay? 8.47, okay. You carry, you take the 4, the four at the front. take the 8, you want to divide that by 4. That makes 2. Take the 7, uh, you know what I mean. <laughs> you know what I mean, bro. <laughs> let me in. Can you let me in yeah, now? Yeah, I'm a friend of, uh... Yeah, I'm a friend of... I'm a friend of Mary Jane's, bro. <laughs> Can you let me in now? And it's good that James Franco wasn't in this show. 
Um, it would be good if James Franco wasn't in anything ever again, probably. And I say this as someone whose second favourite book is As I Lay Dying, and of course adored his adaptation. We are all complicit. Every one of us. You, me, the Hulu executives who commissioned the show, all of us.